It's going to be legend. Wait for it. And I hope you're not lactose intolerant because the second half of that word is dairy. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 Barney Stinson rules of life. If I can leave you with one thought, it's this. Nothing and everything is possible. For this list, we'll be going over the aphorisms, rules, and theories devised by Barney Stinson on the sitcom How I Met Your Mother. If there's an idea developed by the barnacle whose absence doesn't suit our list, be awesome and please tell us in the comments. Number 10. The Cheerleader Effect Sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees. While hanging out at a bar, Barney laments the lack of attractive women around. I am not impressed with the talent in here tonight. And the more I drink, the less attractive they get. I am one scotch and soda away from the cantina scene in Star Wars. The rest of the gang points out a group in the corner they all agree are hot. However, Barney asks them to look again. Collectively, they appear attractive in a phenomenon he calls the cheerleader effect though it goes by other names. The cheerleader effect is when a group of women seems hot, but only as a group, just like with cheerleaders. They seem hot, but take each one of them individually, sled dogs. Just like cheerleaders, these women appear hot as a group, but individually, not so much. Barney later experiences the same effect with a group of guys he befriends. It's the cheerleader effect. Uh, no, Ted, that only works for chicks. Take a good look at each one of those guys individually. Notably, real scientists have studied this cognitive bias and found that it has some merit. They even named it after Barney's theory. And that, my friends, is the cheerleader effect, also known as the bridesmaid paradox, sorority girl syndrome, and for a brief window in the mid-90s, the Spice Girls conspiracy. Scary spice indeed. <laughs> Number 9. Who Corporate America Wants when Robin needs to get a job to stay in the US, the gang goes over their resumes. Barney suggests a video one and uses his own to demonstrate. Barney Stinson, you've achieved great success in business, athletics, and personal relationships, and have been an inspiration to many people. Is that you? Are you interviewing yourself? It's a perfectly Barney affair, complete with him interviewing himself using different accents, empty, meaningless aphorisms, and a mini music video of Barney singing a song about how awesome he is. Is that you again? Are you singing a song about yourself? Absolutely not. That would be lame. As amazing as it is, his friends point out that it ultimately says nothing about his qualifications. Barney tells them that's the point, that corporate America wants people who seem like daring mavericks, but who don't actually take any risks or go against the grain. You don't do a damn thing in any of these clips. Exactly. Because that's who corporate America wants. People who seem like bold risk takers, but never actually do anything. Actually doing things gets you fired. It may come in a ridiculous package, but Barney's spitting facts here. To become the possimpable. <laughs> the possimpable? Really? Inventing your own word shows creativity and vision. Vigitivity. Number eight, the Ewok line. When Barney learns that his girlfriend Nora doesn't like Ewoks, he's quite upset, but not for normal Star Wars fan reasons. Nora hates Ewoks. Well, I have to break up with her. Be gentle when you tell her, guys. I'll call you from Vegas. Tell me how it went. Okay. Okay, Barney, sit down. Instead, he interrupts a tour Ted is giving to do a presentation on the subject. He has quite a lot of material prepared, but Ted tells him to get to the point. The point is that, according to Barney, those born after a certain year do like Ewoks, and those born before don't like them. Anyone born on this side of the Ewok line was at least 10 years old when Jedi came out, and thus too old for something so cloying and cute. Anyone born on this side loved the Ewoks. This Ewok line correlates with how young someone is because of how Ewoks reminded kids of their teddy bears. Therefore, Nora is older than she claims to be. Kevin and I are Kaputsky. You think that's bad? The world is coming to an end. You think that's bad? My girlfriend is 37. The theory doesn't entirely work since people born after the line can watch them later, but it's still fun. Bonnie, I didn't see any of the Star Wars movies until last year. You... 
You're 29! <laughs> you still have one good year left. Number seven, the three days rule. Let's be clear, Barney didn't invent the three days rule. Everyone knows you wait three days to call someone after you get their number or after a date. I got a new rule. It's kind of crazy, but I call it, you like her, you call her. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I don't speak, I never get laid. It's been an unwritten rule for dating for what feels like forever, or according to Barney, around 2,000 years. After Ted considers calling a girl immediately after getting her number, Barney chastises him and cites Jesus as the one who began the three days rule. Seriously, Jesus started the whole wait three days thing. He waited three days to come back to life. It was perfect. If he'd have only waited one day, a lot of people wouldn't have even heard that he died. They'd be all, hey, Jesus, what up? Barney's description of Jesus' resurrection, as only he can tell it, is hilarious and surprisingly apt. Plus, it's Sunday, so everyone's in church already. They're all in there, oh no, Jesus is dead. Then bam, he bursts through the back door, runs up the aisle, everyone's totally psyched, and FYI, that's when he invented the high five. We'd love to hear him tell more Bible stories, even if the dialogue sounds a little stilted. And then Jesus would have to explain how he was resurrected, and how it was a miracle, and then the dude would be like, uh, okay, whatever you say, bro. <laughs> wow, ancient dialogue sounds so stilted now. Number six, the chain of screaming. Face turning red, vein in his forehead about to burst, spittle flying like shrapnel, Everyone you work with walking by your office, peering in. After Marshall's boss yells at him, he's at a loss at how to respond. At the bar, Barney tells him about the chain of screaming, or the circle of screaming. When your boss screams at you, you never scream back. That's why there's a little thing in corporate America I like to call the chain of screaming. Chain of screaming? Yes. The chain of screaming starts at the top. In this theory, bosses will always scream at those below them, who in turn take out their anger and frustrations on those below them, or let it bleed into their home life. Arthur screams at you. You go home and scream at Lily. Lily screams at one of the kids in her kindergarten class. Then that kid screams at her dad, Arthur's boss is boss. Occasionally, it loops back around, hence the circle. While it's certainly not a healthy rule to live by, it is a common phenomenon in the workplace and other places in life. And the whole thing starts all over again, thus completing the circle of screaming. Number five, the date time continuum. When his girlfriend Stella invites Ted to her sister's wedding in six months, he's forced to re-examine their relationship. When is it? Uh, first week in November. Is that the something bad that she invited you to a wedding? Six months from now, as in, We'll be together six months from now. He cites a rule devised by Barney. In this rule, Barney states that you should never make plans with someone you're dating longer than the amount of time you've been going out with them. You never make plans with a girl further in the future than the amount of time you've been going out. You've been dating this girl for what, two weeks? No, you're not taking her to a Springsteen concert in January. A relationship's time scale is relative, so making plans outside the boundaries that have existed thus far can easily lead to complications. But Barney had a point. As soon as she started talking about the wedding, it freaked me out. Oh, that sounds like so much fun. Mm. So I get to look forward to it for six months. Just twice as long as we've been dating. Uh-oh. Although there are probably exceptions, like with every rule, it's still a great guideline, particularly for early on in a relationship. Number four, the mermaid theory. When Marshall gets a new secretary, Barney tells him it's only a matter of time before he's attracted to her. Mark my words, Marshall, someday, you will find Iris so excruciatingly attractive, you won't be able to look her directly in the boobs. Marshall is initially dismissive since he doesn't find her attractive. Barney relates how the myth of the mermaid came to be, that sailors mistook manatees for beautiful women after too long at sea. It got so bad that eventually, the manatees out in the water started to look like beautiful women. Mermaids. Which is true. But Barney's mermaid theory is that no matter how initially repugnant you find someone, spending enough time around them can and will lead to them going from manatee to mermaid. Today you see Iris as a manatee, but she ain't gonna stay that way. Marshall, your secretary's mermaid clock starts right now. As rooted as Barney's theories are in bro culture, this totally applies to all sexes. Everyone can hear that siren song eventually. 
What are you looking at? Dude, we need to find land. Number three, the hot crazy scale. Everyone, this is Blah Blah. <gasps> Please call me Blah. The gang meets Ted's new girlfriend, whose name he can't remember. And upon hearing they met online, Barney concludes that she must be crazy if she's beautiful. He then explains the hot crazy scale, which he illustrates in animated graph form. A girl is allowed to be crazy, as long as she is equally hot. <laughs> Thus, if she's this crazy, she has to be this hot. If she's this crazy, she has to be this hot. According to the scale, a woman must be at least as hot as she is crazy to be worth dating. Blah Blah makes several moves on the scale during the evening. She's gotten crazier, but no hotter, which has caused her to drift across the Mendoza diagonal and dangerously close to the Shelley Gillespie zone. Another girl I dated. She gained 20 pounds and tried to kill me with a brick. We like to think that most of these theories can apply to women and men. But in this case, crazy dudes are not worth it regardless of hotness. We'll let Donald Glover explain. Like, why don't women have crazy men's stories? I don't really hear them. And then I realized, I was like, oh, it's because if you got a crazy boyfriend, you gon' die. Number two, the platinum rule. Ted's embarrassing butterfly tattoo is a source of endless amusement for his friends. Say goodbye, kids, because it won't be around much longer. Oh, but Ted, if you get rid of the butterfly, how's everyone going to know you're a stripper from Reno with daddy issues? It also leads him to meet Dr. Stella Zinman, who is his tattoo removal expert. The rest of the gang are incredulous that he asks Stella out, because as Barney puts it, Dude. Don't poop where you eat. He goes on to explain what he calls the platinum rule, named in reference to the golden rule in the Bible, which can be interpreted as love thy neighbor. The platinum rule is never to love thy neighbor. Now the golden rule is love thy neighbor, but there's one rule above it, the platinum rule. Mm. Never, ever, ever, ever love thy neighbor. As he details throughout the episode, getting involved with someone you see on a regular basis almost always leads to awkwardness and unexpected complications. Okay, bye. I mean, not bye, I'm not leaving. I'll be over there. Okay. It's aptly named since it's a valuable lesson, especially with service personnel. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are a few honorable mentions. The Lemon Law, an amicable way to back out of doomed dates, if only it were so easy. From the moment the date begins, you have five minutes to decide whether you're going to commit to an entire evening. And if you don't, it's no hard feelings, just good night. Thanks for playing. See you never. The International Date Line, the line between date and dinner with a friend slash acquaintance is finer than you'd think. The date line is the border betwixt happiness and sorrow. On this side, you go home tonight. On this side, home tomorrow. The freeway theory. Every relationship slash freeway has its bumps, but make you want to take an exit. The first exit, my personal favorite, is six hours in. You meet, you talk, you have sex, you exit when she's in the shower. So every girl you have sex with feels the immediate need to shower? Actually, yeah, I get that. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. What makes a legendary moment? The night before his wedding to Robin, Barney gets drunk and decides to impart his wisdom to two young guys he meets on the street. His final and most poignant piece of advice is, Whatever you do in this life, it's not legendary unless your friends are there to see it. Good luck, boys. It's a sentiment that Barney has expressed to Ted before, but never so succinctly. Because you're my best friend, all right? You don't have to tell me I'm yours, but the way I see it, we're a team. Without you, I'm... Just the dynamic Uno. Barney gets up to all kinds of weird things, and he's constantly dragging his friends into misadventures. They always make for good stories. Did you guys really do that? We really did. And that was when I realized why I hung out with Barney. I never got where I thought I wanted to go, but I always got a great story. And that's the point, because legends are made in the telling, and they can't be told unless they're lived first. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.